This is Craig Migliaccio from AEC Service Tech, and today what we're going over is some refrigeration cycle training on walk-in boxes. We have our automatic pump-down refrigeration cycle, and I'm going to be going over all the components coming up. This is one of 11 sets of PowerPoints that we have available for HVACR teachers over to our website at acservicetech.com. Now this one has to do with the refrigeration cycle of a walk-in box. And because this system has a solenoid valve, this is an automatic pump down refrigeration unit. Now these are also equipped with a low pressure control right on the vapor line, right before the compressor. So before I get into any of the other components within the system, I just wanna explain what's happening. And so you have your, your walk-in box right here where we store product. And so that product is likely food, and so you're trying to absorb the heat energy from the product and from the inside of the box. And that heat energy is getting stored in the refrigerant. The refrigerant's flowing to the outdoor unit and that's where the refrigerant rejects the heat out. So that's how you lower the temperature. We're manipulating the refrigerant in order to absorb heat and then end up rejecting heat. And we do that with a fan inside and a fan outside. Before we get started, I just wanna go over the refrigerant states that we have on the top left. So we have a color indication for each phase, basically, of the refrigerant as it's flowing through this system. And so you can see our dark blue color, that's a liquid, that's low pressure, low temperature. Our slightly lighter blue, that's a low pressure, low temperature vapor. You have our light red, that's high pressure, high temperature liquid, and then our dark red, which is high pressure, high temperature vapor. So let's go ahead and get started through all the steps of the refrigeration cycle. Step one is where we have our low pressure, low temperature vapor refrigerant entering the reciprocating compressor. And you can tell it's a reciprocating compressor because it has pistons, and those pistons are pushing like this. You can't have any liquid refrigerant entering into that reciprocating compressor or it'll damage it. We have vapor refrigerant entering and it is low in temperature. When it is low in temperature, it's actually gonna be absorbing some of the heat from that motor inside the compressor shell. And we got step two, that's the compressor outlet. So the compressor's job is to increase pressure. So you're gonna go from a low pressure vapor to a high pressure vapor. So the refrigerant exits as a high pressure, high temperature, superheated vapor. You gotta remember about refrigerants that anytime that you increase pressure, temperature rises. So anytime you increase temperature, pressure rises. We're at the hottest point in the entire system at the discharge of the compressor. It does not press out liquid out of the compressor. It's only vapor. So the discharge line, once again, that's the hottest part in the entire system where you have your discharge gas, and then it goes over towards the condenser coil. The condenser coil, that's where it desuperheats. It's a fancy word for just saying it's rejecting the heat energy while it's in the vapor form. And, and when you think about vapor form, you're really thinking about steam. Thinking about the, the refrigerant is in the kind of the steam form, it's just a gas. As it's uh, passing through that coil and as the fan is pushing air across the coil, the refrigerant is rejecting some of its heat energy and it's lowering in pressure and lowering in temperature as that's happening. And then you have the saturated state where you have, uh, you've rejected so much heat energy that now the refrigerant starts to phase change into a, both a liquid and vapor state at the same time. That's what we call saturated or saturation. And so it's starting that process. And so you could say, hey, it's 95% vapor and 5% liquid. At this point, that refrigerant will no longer lower in temperature. So until it, until it comes out of the phase change. And so what you need to remember is it's going through this saturated state Basically, it's locked at a temperature that's higher than the outdoor air. The refrigerant's able to reject heat as it's phase changing. The phase change is a secret to this whole thing even working. As that refrigerant's going through there, it's not changing in temperature. It is just phase changing into more of a liquid state. You're gonna have, say, at the beginning, it's 5% 5% uh, liquid and 95% vapor. Then it may be 50-50 mixture of liquid and vapor as it's traveling through the coil. Then towards the end of the coil, it gets to about, say, 5% vapor and 95% liquid. It's coming out of the saturated state, like at the end of the condenser coil. So the condenser liquid subcooling begins. So all of a sudden now it's in the fully liquid state. It's given up so much heat energy that now it's, it's the refrigerant is fully liquid. Subcooling continues and subcooling, what that is, is the lowering in temperature of the liquid refrigerant after 
the phase change. We have subcoin continues as it's going through that coil. So now you're lowering in temperature and now you have the liquid refrigerant entering into the receiver tank. You see it's just kind of like pouring into there. So the liquid's gathering at the, at the bottom of the tank and then you have a dip tube. So where you have the refrigerant exiting at, it's in the fully liquid state because it's kind of siphoning the liquid from the bottom of the tank out through the outlet. That tank, the whole point of a receiver tank, that's to store subcooled liquid refrigerant. So maybe this walk-in box is all the way down in temperature and there's not as much refrigerant needed by the thermostatic expansion valve in order to absorb the heat and to still have vapor exiting that indoor coil. And we'll get to that in a little bit. So the whole point is that you could have a, a low load, but the thermostatic expansion valve's job is to make sure that only vapor is getting to that outdoor compressor. So that's kind of part of the job. The receiver tank will fill up more with liquid when you have a low heat load inside this walk-in box. It also has to do with outdoor ambient temperature changes and how much uh, liquid is in that outdoor uh, coil in the outdoor condenser coil and also the receiver tank has another function and it's for the pump down either the manual pump down of the whole system that's where all the refrigerant would end up going all the subcooled liquid refrigerant would go into that tank instead of it just all building up in the condenser coil the other function is in this case because we have a solenoid valve the refrigerant ends up automatically getting pumped down into the outdoor unit so it takes some of the some of the some of the pressure off of that compressor so if you're filling up that condenser coil, you're gonna be extremely high in pressure, high in temperature every time you pump down. So the whole point is that that receiver tank is going to store the subcooled liquid refrigerant so it's not all stuck in the condenser every time that this unit would shut off. You have liquid refrigerant exiting the receiver tank. And so the liquid travels through the king valve. So the king valve is the uh, three position surface valve that you find either on the top of the receiver tank or on the side. And once again, it has that dip tube that goes down to the bottom of the tank. And there is an access port there on the side in order for you to take a, a high pressure reading there. And so you have your filter dryer inlet. So the filter dryer's job is to absorb any moisture in the system and to hold it there so that it doesn't turn into acids. Basically, anytime that you have moisture mixing with the refrigerant oil, it can create alcohol and acids. And the, the job of that filter dryer is to store any moisture that may be in the system so that it, it does not make that refrigerant oil acidic, which would end up hurting the compressor. You gotta remember that the reciprocating compressor, the windings, or inside of the compressor shell. There's a little bit of resin separating each wrap of the wire. The job of the filter dryer is really to protect protect those windings from acidic refrigerant laying on it and eating, eating away at the resin. And then what would happen is that compressor would end up burning out. It would end up shorting uh, the compressor windings. That's the job of the filter dryer. Uh, so then you have the filter dryer outlet. There should not be any pressure drop across that filter dryer. So if you were to take a temperature clamp on the inlet and the outlet of the filter dryer and you noticed, hey, there is a, there's a significant temperature drop across it, well, that means that that filter dryer is clogged and they usually have a pre-screen and then you have the desiccant in the middle. That pre-screen uh, may be fully clogged or the desiccant maybe has broken up or something and, and has clogged clogged up. You shouldn't really have any temperature change across that filter dryer. So maybe you might have 0.2 degrees or something like that. That's fine because you got to think that that shell is large. In that case, it is kind of like a heat sink to the outdoor air. So you got to remember that. So there will be just a tiny, tiny bit, but not much at all. Liquid refrigerant is unaffected. So it's subcooled liquid refrigerant is unaffected as it goes through the filter dryer, then it enters into the solenoid. So that's a liquid solenoid valve. So you have right in there, so a, a magnetic solenoid. The solenoid is gonna pull the uh, iron core upwards. It's going to allow the liquid refrigerant through the solenoid and to go through. When you are not powering that solenoid, that iron core is gonna end up falling down and there's a spring that's gonna push it down as well. So it's gonna kind of hold that plunger down and stop the liquid refrigerant from flowing. What that means is that your liquid refrigerant is going to back up in the receiver tank. Your pump down will, will occur. It would be the same thing as shutting down your liquid line service valve, your king valve, and not allowing any uh, liquid to come to the indoor unit. So the next thing is the liquid line sight glass. So you can tell if you have subcooled liquid going through there by looking at the, basically the glass in the front. And so the whole point is if you see bubbles going through there, then you do not have fully 
liquid. So that also means that you do not have any subcooling whatsoever. You see bubbles, that will be a problem, right? During the automatic pump down, there should be any liquid that's in front or after downstream of that solenoid valve. During the pump down, it shouldn't take a whole long time in order for that sight glass to become clear. So you'll see bubbling and then it should become clear as that system is pumping down because there's no more subcooled liquid there. So during normal operation, you should just see it fully clear with liquid passing through it. So now we have our liquid refrigerant, so that's subcooled liquid refrigerant remains unaffected. No subcooling change occurs as it goes through the filter dryer, the solenoid valve, or the liquid sight glass while we're in normal operation. So then we have subcooled liquid refrigerant entering the metering device. And the metering device is the component that separates the high pressure side from the low pressure side of the system. So it's, it's an actual restriction. It's meant to be a restriction in order to lower the pressure, which therefore it's gonna be lowering the temperature of the refrigerant. Now I have a whole nother video on how the thermostatic expansion valve actually works. You can check that out, but basically what's happening is you have that bulb at the top. That is a opening force. As this, this uh, line that's carrying our vapor refrigerant that's exiting the indoor coil, as that temperature changes on the copper tubing itself, that bulb has refrigerant in it and that refrigerant ends up heating up because it's touching this line and it exerts force downwards on the head of the TXV and it's going to open up the restriction in the middle of the TXV. It's gonna open it up to allow more refrigerant through. Now there's two closing forces. So we just said the bulb is a opening force, it's pressing down. We have two closing forces, and one is the external equalization line that's on that suction tubing, and that's measuring pressure. So we have pressure coming upwards, and then you have a spring pressure on the bottom. And the spring pressure and external equalization pressure are trying to close or push up on the pin inside the TXV. Normally in refrigeration systems, you have an adjustable TXV with a stem at the bottom that you can adjust with a ratcheting service wrench. Now, I would not suggest for anybody to immediately go to that and, and do an adjustment there as an initial, initial thought of how you're gonna fix the system. That would be the last thing that you would, that you would touch because you could have an issue where it's just that the bulb has leaked refrigerant out and maybe the power head assembly needs to get changed out. Basically, when you adjust that stem pressure, you're adjusting the spring pressure. You're either loosening the pressure on the spring or you are increasing the pressure at the spring by compressing it. And so, like I said, there's a whole nother video on how that works. We have our high pressure, high temperature, subcooled liquid refrigerant entering the TXV. The job of the TXV is actually to maintain what's called superheat across that indoor coil. And we'll get to that in just a little bit. But in this case, as you can see, it's immediately lowering the pressure. And there's also a phase change occurring right here because we've lowered the pressure so much. And so you have high pressure, high temperature, liquid refrigerant entering, and then you have about, say, we'll just call it 80% liquid and 20% vapor already, just because of the lowering in pressure. That's where you can see this, this light blue right here. That's your vapor refrigerant. You have your basically, we'll just call it low pressure liquid entering into that indoor coil, but you gotta remember that you're gonna have a little bit of vapor there. And now what it's doing is it's absorbing heat energy at that indoor coil. The heat energy is actually going into the refrigerant, right? And the refrigerant is storing that heat. And now you have, instead of it being say 80% liquid, 20% gas, like flash gas, what you have as you move through that coil is now you have 50-50 mixture, 50% liquid, 50% vapor. As you continue through that coil and you're getting near where you're exiting the coil, right there you have superheating begins. And that means that now all of a sudden there's no more liquid left. And so it goes 50-50 mixture, 75-25, and then you have say 95% vapor, 5% liquid, and then right there in the coil, now it's completely in the vapor state. I wanna back up for just one second because what you need to, to know about this refrigerant is that during the phase change, it's at a, it's fixed basically at a lower, lower temperature than the product that's inside of this room and the temperature within this room. It's able to absorb heat energy because the refrigerant's at a lower temperature. And then you just have your, your fan. So the fan is moving the air that's within this box across the coil. And that's how the refrigerant's able to absorb it because you have air getting moved across the coil. Then you have the aluminum fins, which then you have the copper tubing in the inside, and then you have the refrigerant 
on the inside of that. So their energy is being transferred through the air, then into the aluminum, then into the copper, and then into the refrigerant. And so that refrigerant is then storing the heat energy and doing its phase change. And once it gets out of the phase change and it becomes completely into the vapor state, that's when it's going to be increasing in temperature. The refrigerant will be increasing in temperature. As it's going through the box, it's increasing in temperature, maybe a little closer to the actual temperature within, within this box. So the temperature on this line is higher than it is right here. Temperature of the refrigerant, it's now fully in the vapor state, is increasing. That's what the definition of superheat is. It's the increase in temperature of the vapor refrigerant after it's done the saturation or done the phase change. So now total superheat, so superheat is measured right here. Superheat is measured right after the phase change to where the to where the refrigerant is exiting the indoor coil. That's called superheat. Total superheat is a measurement uh, that's taken basically between here and at that outdoor port. The cool thing about this is that we can measure total superheat with a temperature probe on the vapor line at the outdoor unit and a pressure reading at the outdoor unit. We're measuring pressure to then convert it to temperature though. So it's gonna be temperature on the vapor line minus the saturated temperature that we find by measuring the pressure. That's the total superheat. And if you wanna learn more about superheat, total superheat, subcooling, make sure to read the full articles that we have over the website at acservicetech.com. You can also look up AC Service Tech subcooling, AC Service Tech total superheat. So then that vapor refrigerant enters back through the vapor service valve. Remember that's a three position service valve and I have a video on that down in the description section below. Then you have the vapor refrigerant enters back into the compressor again. So you gotta remember that the thermostatic expansion valve's job is to make sure that the refrigerant is superheated before the refrigerant exits the indoor coil. And so it may have six degrees or eight degrees of superheat. And that's gonna protect the compressor. And here's why. If you had zero degrees of superheat, that means that the refrigerant is still in its saturated state. The phase change is not done yet and you still have liquid refrigerant in the mixture. If liquid refrigerant was able to get over to that compressor, it's going to damage it. It's gonna break it. It cannot compress the liquid. The thermostatic expansion valve, if it measures and holds six degrees of superheat, based on the three pressures that it has from the bulb and the external equalization line and the, the stem, which is the spring pressure. If it's able to maintain six degrees of superheat, then we know that it's fully in the vapor state as the refrigerant is entering into that compressor. That's how this whole thing works. And you could add other controls and explain other things on this. You know, like a condenser fan cycling switch or a head pressure control valve or a low pressure switch. So because this system has a solenoid valve, we would have a low pressure control on the vapor line right before the compressor inlet. The job of that pressure switch is to shut off the compressor during the automatic pump down cycle where the the thermostat inside the, the, uh, the walk-in box is going to be turning off the solenoid valve, which then is going to have the pump down occur where we have all the liquid refrigerant basically now stored in the receiver and the compressor is basically pulling all the refrigerant from after the solenoid valve on, and it's pumping it past itself into the condenser coil and into the receiver. Well, when that's happening, you're lowering in pressure, right? And once you get down to a low enough pressure, the pressure switch is going to shut off the, or turn off the compressor. And then the compressor is gonna stop and all of your refrigerant is gonna be downstream of the compressor and the compressor does not allow refrigerant to bleed back across it back to the indoor coil again. So that's the object of a pump down refrigeration system. So once again, if you're looking for these PowerPoints, we have these available over at our website at acservicetech.com. And if you wanna learn about charging air conditioning systems, make sure to check out our Refrigerant Charging and Service Procedures for Air Conditioning book, our thousand question workbook with answer key. And we also have our quick reference cards. These are all available at our website at acservicetech.com. We also have our refrigeration cycle PowerPoints. We have a couple PowerPoints there. We also have our posters. We have seven different posters in a pack that you can hang in a classroom or in a shop. So we have all of our physical resources over on Amazon and our website. Hope you enjoyed yourself. We'll see you next time at AC Surface Tech Channel.